Welcome to the Retiring Real Estate Investor Podcast, where we will discuss how to defer taxes on the sale of your property, earning passive real estate income, and everything you need to know to go from active investor to passive investor. Join us as we interview passive investment sponsors, explore the journey of other retiring real estate investors, and share our due diligence process we perform to select passive investments. Investment advisory services provided by Insight Investment Advisors, LLC, a registered investment advisor. This podcast is only intended for clients and interested investors residing in the states in which we are registered to provide investment advisory services or exempt from registration. Please contact us to determine if the firm provides investment advisory services in the state where you reside. All content on this podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice. Material presented is believed to be reliable sources, and no representations are made by our firm as to another party's informational accuracy or completeness. Insight Investment Advisors LLC and its representatives do not provide tax or legal advice, and nothing herein should be construed as such. Always consult with your tax advisor or attorney regarding your specific circumstances. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Retiring Real Estate Investor Podcast. I am your host, Brandon Bruckman. I am joined by Shannon Robnett. Shannon, thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks, Brandon. I'm glad to be here. Shannon is a developer, and we were talking a little bit before I hit record. We got some interesting things to talk about on the development side. So maybe start our listeners with give give a background of how you came to this space and some of the things you're starting to see that are, frankly, really interesting. You know, I, I actually grew up in a development family. So my dad uh, started out building houses, couldn't get enough lots. So he started building subdivisions to build houses, did some industrial. And so I just always saw that at the kitchen table. Mom had come home. She was talking with the Smiths down the street. They wanted to expand their T-shirt shop. They needed to buy something. Dad says, well, gee, we got something here. And I saw how if you could create the product, you had control of your marketplace in a, in a whole different way. And then I watched my dad and my mom retire at 50 with this thing called cash flow, right? So I knew that there was something to it because they worked hard, but they were able to check out and be done and get the mailbox money that we were all looking for. And they didn't deal with a whole lot of tenants, toilets, and trash, but they did some. And so I just kind of saw how that became valuable. And I began to chase that in my career. And I was, I've been a merchant builder for 27 years in my own companies. Now I strictly develop uh, and, and build for myself. We do do some value add. We do some other things, but we're really heavy in the industrial space, even though we do $100 million worth of new development and multifamily every year also. Oh, this is fascinating. So I don't come from a development family, to say the least. Um, walk, us, walk us through, walk our listeners through, and maybe me a little bit. What are the basics? What's one on one? Where where does someone where do you start? Like where you mentioned industrial is a big focus. So yeah. when you look at is it about market first? Are you starting there? Like where am I going to put this? Where's a good market? Well, yeah, I mean, so you know, we look at where's the supply and demand problem, right? Mm -hmm. Because you know, there's there's always that old. I mean, when people think of industrial, right, they think of the old, you know fallen down metal building that's breezy. These guys are in there greasy and they're welding and you got mechanics and you got all this stuff. And that's not necessarily what we're talking about. The next place they go is the million square foot Amazon buildings. And that's, that's not really where we go either. We look at where are new houses being built? Where is supply and demand for goods and services? Where's the guy that's, that, you know, does the dog training? Uh, we've got that tenant. Where's the guy that builds cabinets? Well, we've got that tenant. Where's the guy that builds batting cages? We've got that tenant. Mm. So where's the carpet distributor? We've got that tenant. So where are these goods and services where the guy needs a small office, a roll up door? And when you see that demand, then you start looking for vacant ground around that. You start looking at how that puts together. You're talking with the city, you're finding out what they want to do there, how they like that. Will you get it approved? And then you move forward with buying the land, drawing the plans, building the buildings, finding the tenants and putting that whole package together. Because the thing is, when you do development, you're really creating the original value add, right? Mm -hmm. I'm taking the sticks and stones. I just finished a product, took the sticks and stones for $2.7 million, created a five and a half million dollar asset by adding the tenants. If I would have just built that building, I could have sold that building vacant for 3.9. Mm -hmm. But once you add the tenants, you add that original value add, and now you've got the cash flow contingent on there that everybody wants to buy. And it's that original gap 
that we solve that problem in the development space and create that place for people to come in, bring their businesses, set up, do their thing. And at the end of the day, when you're all said and done, you've got an incredibly viable product. But the best parts about it are what the tenants do for you that you don't have to do for them. Oh, that's phenomenal. So, oh man, I have like six questions rushes through my head at the same time. All right, let's pick them apart. One, it sounds like, okay, so where do I look? Where do I start? Supply and demand. It sounds like a path of progress item. So yep. it sounds like a leading indicator for you is where is the population growing? Where are they heading? Am I picking that up right? Yeah. And then the other thing you can do is you can go on most of your city websites will have what's called a comp plan, which is their comprehensive mm. plan. So you can look at that and you go, hey, here's the industrial area mm. of the comp plan. So then you can go find that industrial area. You can call your broker, right? It's not the same broker you're using for your multifamily stuff. Mm -hmm. It's a different broker. Mm -hmm. And you're looking at, hey, where's the industrial land at? What can we do here? What do you need, right? Because as we see areas expand, you know, I, I hear about Florida. Everybody's moving to Florida and I see all the houses being built. But when the houses get built, then you've got all the other goods and services that go with that carpet cleaning guys, you know, the, the window tinters, all that kind of stuff. So they all need those spaces and the city has the, the perfect place for them already designated in their land use maps. And you can find that and you know right where to go. Oh, you're on to it. See, someone's done the work. Someone's done this work for you a little bit. And that's huge, oh, right? Yeah. Is, is dealing with, so when I think about, when I think about the city and zoning and requirements and what they're looking for, this is an amazing leading indicator, correct? I mean, you could probably run into some trouble if you're bumping against that plan instead of yeah. working with it, I would imagine, correct? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I at 22 years old, I, I learned very quickly that it was very easy to go in there and say, hey, can I get a little help, right? Mm. Looking at this piece of ground, what do you think, you know? And when I was 22 years old and going in there and trying to get help, they obviously wanted to help the fresh-faced kid, right? Now mm -hmm. I'm a little gray in the face and everything. <laughs> But if you're asking the questions, it's really easy for them to help you, right? Mm -hmm. If you're telling them, hey, I'm going to do an industrial building here, and they go, well, it's not quite zoned for that. Yeah, but I'm going to get it rezoned. I'm going to do that. There's a lot of things you can do that aren't worth the effort, right? Mm -hmm. But the biggest thing that I've found is if you go down to the city and you ask them, what can I do to get this done in the right space, in the right place? How is po this possible? Can you help me? they're usually very, very helpful and you'll wind up being pointed in the right direction and not waste a lot of your time. No, oh, that's huge. What do you know? Ask, ask these folks for help. They actually do want, they do want to help you. If you're asking the right question, if you're asking some good questions and you want to be helpful, like look at how that works. So help me think a little bit about, all right, so let's imagine we're going to walk through this process sort of front to back. We've picked the site out. We've had that conversation. We know what we want to do. Help me think about one thing I've struggled with in this space, and we've struggled as a firm, is thinking about how do we think about cost? How much is it going to cost for us to construct this? Is this sort of a little bit of a, a dark art here where with the experience you have, you have a really good understanding of it? Or is it something you could really break apart into pieces and start to really evaluate and understand and see where those points are of where maybe you can add value and lower that cost? I mean, how do you think about cost and building that number up? Well, and I think this is where, you know, people get into that area, where, like you said, where it, it must be some magical art. But here's the reality, okay? Here's the reality. Every project gets designed backwards. Mm -hmm. I will tell my plumber, I will tell my electrician, I will tell my, my structural steel guy how much money I have to spend. Because I know at the end of the day, I've got to get it built for X, Okay. Mm -hmm. I've got to build it and I've got to get it to cash flow. I've got to, I've got to get my debt service to cover it. I've got all my things that I already know. None of this is a surprise to me, mm -hmm. right? Because look, you know that at the end of the day, you're building to a cap eight. That's what we do. We build to a cap eight, right? So if I'm building to an eight cap, I know that my rents in the area are 10 bucks, which means I can spend X dollars, Right. Now I know that I have to get it done for X dollars. I've got to design it that way, right? But what happens, Brandon, is a lot of people, they go and they find the piece of ground and then they find the architect and the architect says, oh, you know what you need? You need the Taj Mahal. <laughs> and, and you need an elevator for this, you know? And they, and they wind up designing something and you come back yeah. and now instead of being able to build this for $130 a foot, you're at 175 or 185, right? 
But if you're starting the other way around and you're saying, hey, Mr. General Contractor, mm -hmm. I need to be able to build this for 125 bucks a foot for my numbers to work. Let's design this to work at 125 bucks a foot. See, a lot of people get worried about the design build. I embrace that. Mm. So, I mean, look, I'm not. I'm going to try not to offend any engineers on this call, but the reality is, a plumber will design a better plan than a than a mechanical engineer will, hmm. because they're looking at not only the 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 fittings and the cost, they're looking at the labor side of it also, where hmm. the engineer doesn't really estimate that. And so you go to the plumber and you say, "Hey, you got sixty grand to do this, and this is what I need." And he says, "Okay, this is how you design it." I said, "I don't care. You hire your engineer. You bring it to the plant." Right. Mm. So when you're done with the design, the plumber invested his time and effort knowing that he's going to get the job. And I got it done for my cost. So now when I'm done and my plans are ready and it comes out of the city, nobody's shocked, nobody's surprised. And all of a sudden I look like a genius because I met my budget. See, there's a little, there's a little dark art in there. Well, but <laughs> it's, it's, Right. Yeah. I mean, the reality is it's really hard for my plumber to come back to me and tell me, oh, man, I got a I got a change order for you because I didn't figure in this. I'm like, oh, you you designed it. Right. You, <laughs> yeah, it's yours. I don't to tell you, this is all this is all your deal. Right. And yeah. so when you when you do it that way, when you do that design build process, it really helps you to get where you need to go. And you're not spending a lot of time redesigning and cost cutting at the end and and trying to make things work and re-raising money and all that. It, it, it takes a little bit more upfront, but you wind up with a product that's completely buildable and it's very easy to manage that process moving forward. I think it's beautiful what you said, sort of going backwards, forwards on that design backwards. And that's an important thing I think I, I'm pulling out of here is, you know what market rent rates are. This is something you can easily yeah. identify. You know what right. properties are trading for, something you can easily identify. You see supply and demand. If you can build your way back, you can almost come into this with, economics that you can you can easily see and understand you're like oh okay here's it's here's my irr in this right yeah it's economics a contractor can understand right yeah i mean yeah. You, you really there's no rocket science to this because i already know that if i can build this for 125 bucks a foot and i look at the rents in the area i know i'm going to cash flow before i break ground right it's beautiful it's beautiful and you should be and one of the things we sort of emphasize with with our investors is we like the idea of development. I guess value add would fit into this more, but more development, you are creating economic value. As you alluded to earlier, you are taking sticks and stones and things and you're building a, a structure for someone to do something in that, that is value, right? It's making something out of nothing, literally to do but something. Like that. So and now you're at what you're able to do and you're describing to us is you were able to under, identify and understand those economics up front before you frankly stick a shovel in the ground. You were able to understand like, this is what will happen with these economics. When do you think about, when are you ident identifying potential tenants for that facility? Is it before you even think about breaking ground? Do you have an idea of who those would be? You know, the reality is, is we like to make our spaces flexible. Right. Mm. So we've got a 20,000 square foot building that can divide into call it 2000 square foot spaces. Maybe we go 2000, maybe we go 6,000. We don't really know. The offices are kind of up front. The bathrooms are kind of in the back. The power supply is very general. But then one thing that we've always found is that tenants of that size don't really plan ahead. Right. So they're going to be 60 to 90 days out from mm. completion of the building when they're going to show up. Right. Uh. So I have a building now that I have, uh, we just completed the shell 30 days ago. We have 180% occupancy if we took everybody. We're able to go through, figure out our economics of who's gonna need the least TI, who's gonna offer the longest lease, who's gonna be the best use, who's gonna mix with these guys. And so we're able to do that, but they didn't show up until we were about 60 days from completion. Mm -hmm. But we know the general uses in the area and we kind of look around and see what's going on. Um, but they're, they're not as, uh, it's kind of like a little bit like multifamily tenants where you don't know who exactly is going to be there, but you know, they're going to kind of be this particular profile. Um, and, and then you just kind of finish your tenant improvements. But here's the beautiful thing, Brandon, most of these guys are signing five-year leases, right? So you're not going through this process like multifamily where every year you got tenants renewing. Number two, these guys actually have credit. 
they actually have businesses. They've got, you know, they've, they've got legitimate bank accounts. We watched people in 2008 let their houses go back, but they kept their mm -hmm. businesses open because they had to feed the family, right? Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, you, you, these guys are looking for longer term priorities where they're going to build their business and they're really sticky. They don't like to move because if they're, especially if they're service related, people know to come there because that's where Jim's shop is, right? There's a lot to be said here for, and, and I'm going to turn you loose on thinking about multifamily versus industrial in a second, but there's a lot to be said here for the tenant and tenant quality that you're able to identify yeah. and, and get leased up. And then we don't really need to be as, since you're running a five-year lease and you're probably building some escalators in there, we don't need to really be hurt, worried about inflation. So this is the kind of the counter argument that I've heard all the time about industrial and, and those types of properties is, oh, what about inflation, the rampant running of inflation? How are you going to realize that in these deals? And it's like, you've, you've thought about that too as well. Well, you know, the funny thing is, is everybody in the so think about this, Brandon, when you're doing a multifamily building, everybody in there is thinking about watching TV in their space. They're thinking about this is my home. They're thinking about little Jimmy's going to go to this school, right? So they're totally focused on all emotional aspects of things. When you're building industrial, I'm thinking about location to the freeway. I'm thinking about commute time for my servicemen. I'm thinking about where are my customers at? I'm thinking about how is this going to, how much is this going to cost to heat and cool? I'm thinking about very systematic things. And so when it comes mm -hmm. down to it, I know that if inflation is happening, it's affecting my business because I'm going to have to raise my prices. Mm -hmm. And I expect my landlord to do the same. The other thing that's really funny is we do this little thing in our leases called CPI increases. Ah. So when we've had nine, 9% 9 inflation this last year, guess what happened to their rents? They went up 9% and nobody had to argue about it, right? It's 3% and or CPI, whichever is higher. This guy signs a five-year lease. Every year we come to the end of it. But here's the other beautiful thing about industrial that a lot of people forget. Compared to multifamily, the landlord pays the property taxes. So if they go up, I was, we're doing a couple of deals in Houston right now. The last two years have been brutal in Houston because the insurance has gone through the roof because of what happened there a couple of years ago in the freeze, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the landlord has to eat that until he can pass that on to the tenant. And if the guy next door isn't raising his rents, you're going to keep eating it, right? Property tax is another really big deal that you don't have a lot of control over. So when those two things change in the multifamily world, the landlord doesn't have an outlet for that. But in industrial space, that's considered a triple net expense. Mm -hmm. So my rent is $10 and my triple net is $3. And that is a pass-through of all the sewer, the water, the trash, the uh, on-site maintenance, the lawn care, the property taxes, the insurance, all the costs to run the business. And I pass it through to them, including management. So I hand that over to them. And guess what we're doing right now? Mm -hmm. We're going through last year and we're saying, hey, we charged you guys $3, but it costs us $3.15 for the year. So here you owe us the 15 cents and we're going to set next year at $3.20. So 23, we're going to do this. And we adjust every year. So my rent is my rent. That's my profits. That's my expense for letting you use my building. My expenses are your expenses. I pay them. You reimburse me. It's very simple. So at the end of the day, when you're talking about when you're talking about consistent cash flow, when you're talking about consistent uh, payments and consistent rent, and we hardly ever have late on our mm. industrial because the tenants don't do that, right? Mm. Because they don't want to lose their business location, right? So it, it it's really a lot more. I want to call it civilized because it's along the lines of an expectation for business. It's like buying cookies from the Girl Scouts versus going down to the, the grocery store. You would not accept a four-year-old miscounting your change at the grocery store, <laughs> but you will from the Girl Scouts or you will in multifamily, right? The other thing that I've seen, Brandon, is everybody has just beat the ever-loving snot out of the multifamily returns. Mm, yeah. We just put a deal under contract that is going to do a 6% cash on cash day one. Rents are going to adjust in the next couple of uh, 18 months, and we'll renew all of the rents that are coming up. And in less than 18 months, we'll be at a 9% cash on cash return. 
And that's the only value add we're going to do. We're just going to redo the leases. That's not something you can get anymore in multifamily at all. Mm -hmm. Without concerns mm -hmm. of, of upside and, and property taxes and any of these kinds of things, it's just a, it's just a moot point. So we miss, we, we, not we, not me, we, what my impression is as, as a group of investors that say in these asset classes, multifamily, we probably don't think enough about inflation seems like it's this pass through easy thing. I'm just going to, I'm just going to get it because I can raise rents. Not true. Yes, you could maybe, but you have market dynamics and you have a sort of a mismatching of expenses that you're experiencing as a landlord. It's a lot more complicated than just, hey, I own real estate, I own multifamily, so inflation's great. Not necessarily. Right. And then flip side of that is industrial. You're not, as a landlord, you're not experiencing a lot of that inflation. Your tenants are. And right. so it's not even an equation for you. And if you build a lease, as you describe with a CPI index in it, voila, like I'm getting the inflation adjustment in a much more clean way than I would in multifamily, where it's just, a, it's a lot more complicated. Yeah. I mean, I went into, I went into one of my guys spaces and he's been in there for 13 years. God bless him. Right. He's almost paid off the building and I don't even have to deed it to him when he's done, but I went in there and he'd epoxy coated the floors and he put new, uh, new, new uh, vinyl in the office and he'd repainted the office. And I was joking with him and I said, Hey, you didn't get landlord approval to do that. And he goes, yeah, but if I did have the landlord do it, he was just going to charge me 15% over what I could do it for and bill mm. me back. And he's exactly correct. Right. Mm. But this guy's been there for 13 years. He would never even think to call me and go, Hey, I need a new paint job. Right. Yeah. Cause he knows I'm going to get paid for it because he's not going to come out and do what he does for me as a favor. He's going to expect to get paid for it. So mm -hmm. you've changed the mentality of who's there. Right. That's right. And I think that's the biggest thing, but what a lot of people fail to realize, you know, industrial is, is a very stable, asset. It just really, it's, it's a strong asset. You hear about Amazon turning back some of their warehouses and you see a lot of that in these bigger things. That's not the area that I'm running in. I'm running in, you know, 20 to 80,000 square foot complexes that are, you know, 15 to 15,000, 1500 to 15,000 square foot multi-tenant type spaces. And the reality is that's a strong portion of Americana that really, uh, you know, needs the space to do their business they're appreciative of it, but they're very, very simple in their needs and their requirements. And you're able to do it with a lot less staff because there's a lot less normal demand. I mean, you know, the other thing is I had a tenant have a water heater go out last week. Hmm. They were, they called, they let us know. I said, we'll get one out, be, you know, give us a couple of days. If you would have told somebody in your multifamily that it was going to be a couple of hours, they'd have freaked out, right? Mm -hmm let alone the fact that it was going to be a couple of days, but we were going to get it taken care of. Ah, no problem, man. We just use it to wash our hands. It's not a big deal. You know, we'll figure it out. Right. It's just a whole different expectation. Now, not that we don't do multifamily. Mm -hmm. We do, but industrial is just a really in right, especially right now, it's a really overlooked asset class because, in, because industrial has not seen the surge in people trying to purchase it, people trying to buy it and flip it. And it's not really great for a flip. Like you come in, you do the value add three years later, you're, you're, you're letting it go because typically you're picking up three to 4% increase in rents every year. Mm -hmm. So 10 years from now, you've gone up 40% on your rent, which means you've gone up decent in your value, but cap rates don't fluctuate quite like they did with multifamily. So it's real stable, mm -hmm. but it produces beautiful cash flow because it's very, very dependable. Talk a little bit more about that. So if you, if you had, if you were going to do your next, you're, you're obviously looking at development projects all day long, you're gonna do your next development project. You would probably do an industrial project 10 times versus one multifamily. Oh, yeah. What's oh, yeah. talk about the economics that are driving that a little bit. Well, one is speed, right? I can do an industrial development in less than eight months, right? Nine months. Mm. So we can go in and we can build, you know, a hundred thousand square feet of industrial in, in a, in a year, right? And we can tenetize it and we can get from start to finish in a year. When you're talking about building a hundred thousand square feet of multifamily, that's a hundred unit apartment complex. That's going to take you at least 20 months. 
right? Mm -hmm. There's a whole lot more fit and finish that goes into it. There's a whole lot more everything. So getting my investors from start to cash flow much, much, much quicker, right? Then when you're looking at where you're at in the cycle and how long that's going to stay, you know, we're able to keep those. We're able to put life insurance debt on there so you can get a 10 year fixed rate on that three years IO, uh, but a life insurance uh, type debt on there. So you're good for, you know, a decade, right? Mm -hmm. You're doing something that you're really just kind of setting it and forgetting it. You're going into a seven and a half, an eight cap. So you're starting out with decent cash flow up front. You're going to you're going to add to that three to five percent every year. So your cash flow is going to get better. Your debt pay down is going to be on a straight line. It's going to be really easy. You still do your bonus depreciation. You still do all the things that you normally do without a lot of the aggravation that goes with the ups and downs. And the reality is when you go to sell, the cap rate hasn't changed a bunch, you know, and and everybody was really excited about all the cap rate compression, they're not so excited about the decompression that's happening right now, but we're still doing, I mean, I just, I, I looked at a, a, another deal in Houston that's a uh, nationally guaranteed lease. Uh, it's a 15 year lease and it's a seven and a half cap going in with three and a half percent rent bumps. So I'm going to be at a 10% cash on cash very, very quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Where am I going to be at in nine years on this deal? I'm going to be in a really excellent spot. And we're going to be getting some great cash flow on this deal, which is really what a lot of people are looking at. I get it. Multifamily can be good for appreciation, but industrial is really, really excellent for just kind of the set it and forget it, the mailbox money, the kind of stuff that doesn't keep you up at night wondering if you're going to get next month's check. And you're not underwriting... If you're building multifamily, I can't imagine you're underwriting to an eight cap. When we develop, we do. You do, even on the multifamily. Yeah, but you also, you know, think about this. Now you want to talk about dark arts, right? I got to underwrite <laughs> yeah. to an eight cap, and I don't yeah. know what the market's going to do for 30 months, but I got to go out that far, right? I mean, think about this. When you're doing construction, your interest rates aren't locked. You're, you're getting floating rate debt. There is no two ways about that. So I've got construction projects that we started out with with 6% construction money. We're up at 11% now, right? Because mm -hmm. that's just what the market has done. So here we are. We still have six months left to go. The good news is our, our rent rates have gone up. We're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. But we got a lot of interest going on in between, and we're still chugging along. We're not able to get there for 30 months yeah whereas industrial you're a lot shorter window so when you're in a choppy market like this and things are looking kind of i mean now's not a great time to start an, a, a new multifamily development project because we don't know where interest rates are going to be in six months or 12 right. or 24. Right. but you can pretty much know that industrial we know where we're going to be in a year mm -hmm. right we know we're probably going to be around eight and a half nine percent or less and i'm okay with that because I know that my industrial properties, those are business owners and they're going to see that fluctuate along with that. Right. Mm -hmm. I can start, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. You don't have a lot of people moving around because they're stuck in three to five year leases on the other side. Right. You can start fencing, fencing this thing a little bit more on the industrial side as opposed to the multifamily side. And I'm, it's very curious for me to watch. You made a great comment there. People aren't, are not a great time to do multifamily development. And it's interesting to watch a counter narrative to that of, well, we don't have enough housing supply. Right. And again, I think that's too simplistic of a sort of answer. It's like, we've gone a long time without enough housing supply. That's yeah. not necessarily going to be the driver of construction, is it? No. And, you know, that's the reality, right? I mean, there comes a point when America, Americans can't pay any more rent, right? I mean, you've got the C-class apartments. They Those things have been, you know, pencil whipped as much as you can get them to go, you know, the class A stuff, there's still people that are buying that, but in certain markets, you know, Austin's a great market, Dallas, uh, Houston is a great market because people are surging there. Florida's a great market, but are you really building more brand new multifamily in Kansas city? You know, are you really doing more of that in Oklahoma city? Right. Mm -hmm. So right now may not be the best time to step into those markets and expand that supply because you're expanding the top end. And so you're looking at that going, well, I got to get more than what rents are in here today. Right. Today, rents are twenty three hundred bucks. I got to mm -hmm. get twenty five hundred. Right. 
-hmm. Now's not really the time to expand that rent price. Mm -hmm. We're going to see some consolidation of that rent price. And we're going to see that constriction happen until we get so tight in here that it kind of explodes again. And everybody goes, boom, now we're at 2,800. And now you're going to see development happen again. So I think you're mm -hmm. still going to fight that constraint problem mm -hmm. and that interest rate problem. And I think it's going to be a nasty battle. And I think that, you know, as long as you've got, you know, enormous huevos, you can go through this market and build what you want. Mm -hmm. But you've got to have a, a checkbook that's just as big, right? You've got to be able to get there with a paycheck that says, hey, you know what? I don't have a problem paying that rent. Uh, I don't have a problem paying that interest to get to that rent. I don't have a problem paying those overages to get to that rent um, that, that can and are happening in our market right now. That's fascinating. That's fascinating to sort of think about. Yes, you have to be sort of in a great position here to there's there's things to withstand. I mean, there's headwinds here. What what can you do when you've seen in some of these markets, like in, in Austin, you mentioned what what kind of rent increases have we seen? Twenty plus percent. Yeah. There's there's yeah. a cap there's a cap even on Austin. As great yeah. as much we love Austin too. There's a cap well, in those rents too. And we're seeing the you know we're seeing we've seen double digit rent increases for the last eight years here in 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 the Idaho market, oh, and wow. we're seeing that flat line. The last 12 mm. months have only been about 4%, right? And I say only, that's all we ever underwrite to is a 3% rent increase, right? So we're looking like geniuses this whole time. But now we're flatlining. And if you had to build something going from 23 to 2,500, you're going to have a problem when you come to your takeout, right? And so you've got to have the ability to say, hey, that's okay. Mm. We can get there because mm. we can bring equity to the deal when we close that final financing. Or we've got a little bit of an I.O., window or anything like that but it's it's definitely a little bit uh more of a trick where when you're doing that with industrial you're going out into the market and when you see that constriction and you think about the fact that the guy produces widgets here and he's he's got a 300 or 400 thousand dollar annual profit hung up on 1700 dollars on rent that you raised it it's a yeah. whole different whole different process whole yeah, different, different. Right. different economics there you're not bumping up against you know the when your average we're really looking hard at that multifamily side and you know what percentage of rent is your income amongst our right. tenant base and when you're bumping up against that magical say 30 percent of their income they're spending on rent yikes right. flip side of that industrial not even close to that number from no. a rent perspective so you got room right in a lot of cases the rent has absolutely nothing to do with the gross revenues right or the net the net income yep it's it's just an equation. I got a guy, I got a guy for 21 years has been in the same space making gelato ice cream. I don't know what it is, but he he has a huge kitchen and an enormous walk-in freezer in my space. The business has actually sold three times in this space, right? Oh, wow. But where else is he going to go to make ice cream, right? <laughs> I mean, it's not like he's doing this in his garage. You know, he's not he's not freezing it, sticking it in his kitchen. So he has no choices. And moving his operation is going to cost him 15 grand. So we're just going to agree to agree that we're going to pay my rent. Yeah. Easy as that, right? Yeah. When you, when you think about, and I've started to hear this more and more over the past, maybe six to eight months. So concept of reshoring, has this had any impact from your perspective as companies kind of look at the equation of, of offshoring their work and labor and supply chains and go, wait a second. Actually, it's, it might be more economical to be back in America. Are you seeing the impacts of that? Or is it maybe too far away from the typical tenants that, that you're dealing with on a, more of a local level? You know, where we see it is with, um, you know, every recession, if you look at recessions, recessions start businesses. Mm. Go, look at, mm. go look at it. Every mm. recession, every downturn is when businesses start. Mm -hmm. So when COVID started happening, people started moving in off the left coast, right? They were selling their million dollar house. They were moving to places like Houston. They were buying a $450,000 house. It left them with a couple hundred grand to start a business. They need a space to do what they've always wanted to do, right? They've always wanted to, I don't know, sell rubber stamps that tell people, you know, let's go Brandon. I don't know what they want to do, right? <laughs> but that's your business. And you now have the opportunity to do that. And more businesses are going to start in the next 12 to 18 months because of the recession, because of what historically happens, that is going to push that space. 
And as reshoring happens because people are tired of ordering it from China and having the supply chain disruption, that's just going to make it, that's going to exacerbate the problem, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, when you see a, a place like Houston, Texas absorb 21 million square feet of new industrial space in the last 12 months, they absorbed it. They built it and filled it. Wow. That's that, those kind of numbers tell you what's happening on a, on a national level. And so when you look at that, and these are business related transactions, when you've got the price of fuel going up, coming on over on a boat now makes less sense. When you've got, you know, the price of things to happen transactionally, lag time, all that kind of stuff. I think it's going to put enormous pressure on everybody as things get reshored. It will be fun and interesting, won't it? What an interesting time to live in. Um, this has been awesome. Shannon, tell, tell our listeners more about, about your company and um, about kind of how you're structured and how you look for, if you're looking for investor capital, how that process sort of works. You know, so we do syndicate investor capital. Um, you know, I've been in the construction and development space for almost 30 years. We love having the conversation. We do a lot of our stuff as a 506B because I'd like to know who my investors are. Uh, we do some C stuff. We do have a fund. We're like everybody, you know, but we, we focus on new value add on newer stuff. We, we focus on development stuff and we're really kind of sitting in that space where we build it. We bring the ideas. We take care of it from start to finish. We do a lot of opportunity zone stuff. So we're very tax savvy on how to be efficient, you know, and so we're able to really sit down with you and help you structure your thought process about, hey, you know what, I'm getting out of my W-2, I'm pulling money out of my IRA, what's the most efficient way to do those kinds of things so that I can make sure that as I'm drifting off into the cash flow part of my investment career, I've done it as efficiently as possible because really cutting out Uncle Sam is a huge, huge thing. And the easiest way to do that is just start a conversation. Right. I want to talk with you. I want to hear what your investment experience has been. I want to hear what you're thinking. I want to, you know, are we transitioning here? We still need some appreciation. We're only looking for cash flow. Are we looking for tax savings? How do we do that that makes it so that you can efficiently get to the cash flow and get to retirement so that you're in the optimum position to do that? Oh, that's perfect. That's perfect. Yeah, it might be a conversation that <laughs> that we're having with investors every day. Is is an interesting place for them to be as they're shifting away from most of our investors are shifting away from active management, where they're being an operator. And now I'm telling them, look, now you're an allocator of capital, and they're looking at me like, what the hell is an allocator of capital? Like, explain that to me. What my job is? Yeah. You kind of lay out a roadmap for them. Like, your new job is you're a pension and endowment fund manager. Welcome. Yep. Welcome to your new role. Yep. You're uh, you're on the board. You run the you run this new business. Right. We'll help you along in that way. But you have to really shift the way that you think about some of these things. It's a complete mentality shift. Well, and the other thing is you're not, you know, I mean, most investors, they go through this process where it's about accumulating. Right. And they're thinking about, OK, yeah, cash flow is cool. Everybody says, well, I need cash flow because that's what I was taught or that's what everybody said. And that, that's very important. But you're at this point where, just like you said, we only have X. OK, mm -hmm. we've got. 5 million bucks and we got 10 million bucks and we got 2 million bucks, whatever it is, we've got to get all the way to the end and we can't eat the principal. So how do we do this in a way mm -hmm. that's efficient, that eliminates the tax problems, that doesn't create a situation for our heirs? I mean, how do we really do this? And we don't have the opportunity to just keep adding to it because now we're in the total consumption side, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a different place to be. It is. This, <laughs> this has been great. Thank you. Thank you so much for for sharing these items. I think folks will find it's very interesting to learn a lot more about about the development side of the equation here. Where where should people find you? Where can they connect with you? You know, the easiest way to do that is just go to shannonropnet.com. Uh, that's my website. You can see our projects there. We've got job site cameras on the stuff we're building. You can you can oh, get cool. straight to my calendar. You can book a call with me. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can see our past project, our past returns. You can see what's on our plate. It's all right there, shannonrobnet.com. Easy stuff. We'll link that in the show notes. Shannon, thank you again. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for listening. Until next time, take care.